In this video, I want to go through a chi-squared test for homogeneity. So let's jump right into the example. It says medical researchers enlisted 90 subjects for an experiment comparing treatments for depression. The subjects were randomly divided into three groups and given pills to take for a period of three months. Unknown to them, one group received a placebo, the second group received the natural remedy of St. John's wort, and the third group the prescription drug Posrex. After six months, psychologists and physicians, who did not know which treatment each person had received, evaluated the subjects to see if their depression had returned. So what I'm going to be doing here is comparing three different categories. I'm not comparing um, a set of uh, counts to a previously known uh, a previously known distribution. I'm just looking to see if each one of these groups are the same. The second group was, well, let me start with the first group, got a placebo. The second group got St. John's wort. And then the third group got this, <clears throat> excuse me, drug called Posrex. So if we look a little bit further, we can look at this as a table. And when you look at the table, we're looking at it right here, and we can see whether their depression returned or if there was no sign of depression. You can see the breakdown for placebo, St. John's wort, and Posrex. This is a test for homogeneity because I'm, I'm looking to see if each one of these drugs or each one of these treatments turned out to be the same. I'm not comparing these treatments to some previous study or something that was reported uh, by another study. So this is a test for homogeneity. <clears throat> Looking at the breakdown of our distribution right here, I'm just going to go through um, an entire hypothesis test, which is our test for homogeneity. So the parameter that I'm going to test is this one right here. I want to know if the recurrence of depression is the same for each of the treatments. The key word there being the same. Um, homogeneity means the same. So I want to know if the treatments or the recurrence of depression is the same for each one of the treatments. Now, <clears throat> my null hypothesis for this particular problem looks like this. The rate of recurrence is the same for all three treatments. That's what the null says. Everything is the same. The alternative is basically the opposite of that, which says the rate of recurrence differs for some treatments. Now, it doesn't matter how many treatments are different. It could just be one of these treatments being different than the other two or two being different than one. But as long as one of the treatments is different, I'm probably going to end up rejecting my null hypothesis and turning and supporting my alternative, which says the rate of recurrence differs for some of the treatments. Now for a test for homogeneity, just as a little side note, <clears throat> I, want to, I want you to see that your null hypothesis will almost always look something like this. The distribution of the sample is the same as the distribution of another sample. And then the alternative, the distribution of sample X is not the same as the distribution of sample Y. So that's what we have here. We have a sample from placebos, a sample from St. John's wort, and a sample from Posrex. So that's why we can say that just about every null and alternative hypothesis is going to follow this type of, um, this type of pattern. Okay? So let's continue. The next thing we need to check is our assumptions and conditions. So one of the first uh, condition that we need to check is called the counted data condition. So if we go back to our <clears throat> uh, distribution, each one of these uh, numbers is counted. Okay, there were 24. I counted 24 people that took the placebo that had their depression return. I counted 22 people that took St. John's Ward and their depression return, and so on and so forth. So that particular um, condition has been satisfied. Switch this back over to a pen. Here we go. That, that particular condition has been satisfied. The next condition that we need to check is our randomization condition. Now, for the randomization condition, even if your sample was not collected at random, all we really want to know is, did, does the sample represent the population? That's the point of randomizing, um, or the, random, the point of the randomization condition is that you have randomly collected a sample so that it represents the population. So in this case, I would need to say something like the sample represents my population. 
And that would be enough to satisfy that particular condition. A final condition that we need to check is called the expected cell frequency condition. And what I'm checking with the expected cell frequency condition is to see if each expected value is greater than 5. That's what I'm looking for. I should say greater than or equal to. It needs to be at least 5. So how am I going to find the expected counts or the expected values? Well, there's a little trick to this, and I'm going to reveal it right here. Your expected count, you can find your expected count by taking the total amount in your row times the total amount in your column and divide that by the total amount in the table. So it's the row total times the column total divided by the table total. So if I go to the next page, or if I go back to, I'm going to go forward actually, right here. If I look at this, eventually I'm going to be um, finding this test statistic, but I just want to find the expected values. So the expected values, remember, is the row total times the column total divided by the table total. So let's find these values. I've done a little bit of math ahead of time. 24 plus 22 plus 14 is equal to 60. And 6 plus 8 plus 16 is equal to 30. If I go with the columns, 24 plus 6 is 30. 22 plus 8 is also 30. And 14 plus 16 is also 30. So now when I add all of these together for my table total, I end up getting 90. Oh, my pen looks a little bit funky there, but that should be a 90. So... Let's go back and fix that. <clears throat> okay, this should be a 90. Right there it is. So 60 plus 30 is 90. 30 plus 30 plus 30 is 90. So now let's find our expected counts. For each one of these expected counts, sometimes what you'll see is a little line that's drawn uh, in these tables. And so on one side you have your observed values, and on the other side you have your expected values. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. Whatever is underneath this dashed line is going to be my expected values. And I'll go ahead and put those in, uh, I'll put those in purple. Uh, <clears throat> so to find the expected count for placebo depression returned, I take the row total, 60, I multiply that times the column total, which is 30, and I divide that by the table total, which is 90. And when I take this 60 times 30 divided by 90, I end up getting 20. Well, it just so happens that that's going to be the same thing here. For the St. John, John's wart depression, depression returns, it's 60 times 30 divided by the table total, which is 90, and that gives me 20. And I end up getting the same thing here. Now, down here in this one, on the bottom side, I end up getting a row total of 30 times a column total of 30, and I divide that by my table total, which is 90, and I end up getting 10. And working ahead, I end up getting 10 for all of those expected values. <clears throat> now, I want to make a note real quick. Your expected values are not always going to be whole numbers. This just happens to work out pretty nice in this example, and the expected values are, to are um, whole numbers. If you get expected values that are decimals, leave them in decimal form. Do not round them off to whole numbers. Just leave them in decimal form. You can go one or two decimal places, check with your teacher, see what they would like for you to do. <clears throat> but now that I have my observed values and I, have, I also have my expected values, I can move on. Now, if you remember, I started to find all those expected values because I wanted to check the expected cell frequency condition. If I go back... I want to see if every expected value is greater than or equal to 5. Well, you can see 20, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10. Those are all equal or greater than or equal to 5, so this condition has also been satisfied. As we continue through the test, once my assumptions and conditions have been met, I now can say, um, since the assumptions and conditions have been met, we will conduct a chi-squared test for homogeneity with two degrees of freedom. Now, you might say, might say, well, where do you get your degrees of freedom? Let me show you how to find that. In order to determine your degrees of freedom, you take the rows minus 1, which is right here, and you multiply that times the columns minus 1, and that gives you your degrees of freedom. Well, going back to my table, you can see that I have two rows and three columns. So if I go back here, two rows, 
is going to be 2 minus 1 times my columns, 3 minus 1. That gives me 1 times 2. And there's my 2 degrees of freedom. So that's where my 2 degrees of freedom comes from. All right, let's continue with the test. Now that I've found all of my, I've checked all my assumptions and conditions, I've got what kind of test I'm going to conduct, I now need to calculate my test statistic. And in this case, our test statistic is a chi-squared value. Well, to get my chi-squared, I have to find the sum of all of these values. I'm not going to work each one of these out. I've done the math ahead of time, but I'm going to do one of them for you so you can see how I found each one of these, and then I'm going to add them all together. So if I'm trying to find this observed minus expected squared divided by the expected value for placebo and depression returned, it would look like this. My observed value, I can't do the whole thing. I really shouldn't put an equal sign there. Let me just do it off to the side. My observed value is 24 minus my expected, which is 20. Eventually, I'm going to square all of that. And I divide by the expected value in that particular cell, which is 20. And when I do the math here, this ends up being 4 squared over 20. And 16 over 20 is 0.8. So this right here... The value um, to calculate my chi-squared, I'm just going to make a little note and put a 0.8 right there. Okay. <clears throat> now, let me do one more just so you can see how the next one works, and then I'll fill all the rest of them in. So if, let's do this one, placebo and no sign of depression. That would be 6, my observed, minus 10, which is my expected. I'm going to square all of that and divide it by my expected value. And my expected value in this cell is 10. So in this case, I'm going to get negative 4 squared divided by 10. And that's 16 divided by 10. And 16 divided by 10 is 1.6. So this um, value that I'm looking at right here in order to find my chi-squared is 1.6. Now, I've done the math ahead of time, and I'm just going to fill these in. Here, this is 0.2. This one ends up being 1.8. This one here ends up being 0.4. And then this last one is 3.6. So what I'm going to do to find my chi-squared now is I'm going to add all of those numbers together. This symbol right here, sigma, means find the sum. So I want to find the sum of all of those values that are in red. <clears throat> Let me switch back to a different color. Let's go with blue. So this would be 0.8 plus 0.2 plus 1.8 plus 1.6 plus 0.4 plus 3.6. And when I find the sum of all of that, it's going to give me my chi-squared value. And the sum of all of that is 8.4. So chi-squared, which is my test statistic, is 8.4. Now that I have my test statistic, which is 8.4, I want to obtain the p-value. I need to find what my p-value is. So as a reminder, my chi-squared is 8.4. And I'm going to go ahead and show you how you can find your p-value on your calculator. Um, if you're taking this, if you're watching this, you're probably allowed to use your calculator in your class. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my calculator here. And I'm going to go to, uh, let's see, second vars. And then that takes me down to chi-squared CDF. This is similar to normal CDF, which I'm sure most of you have used. But chi-squared CDF, the value that I put in to find the, uh, the p-value is going to be 8.4, which was my test statistic, comma, and different people will tell you different boundaries for your right-hand boundary. I just like to use 999. So I'm going to go ahead and use 999, and then comma, I also have to put in my degrees of freedom. And if you remember, the degrees of freedom was 2. So chi-squared CDF from 8.4 to 999, 2 degrees of freedom, when I hit enter, it gives me my p-value. So here's my p-value of 0 0.01499. All right, let's go back to our other page. We just found that our p-value is equal to 0 0.0, uh, 0 
Oh, I better go back to my calculator. I just forgot. There it is, 0. 0.0499. Sorry about that, 0. 0.0499. So there's my p-value. That's a really small p-value. Now, I established, I, I didn't establish earlier what my alpha level was, my level of significance, but most of the time the level of significance for alpha is equal to 0. 0.05. So if I use that, my p-value is definitely less than my level of significance. Therefore, my decision that I would make about my null hypothesis would be to reject the null hypothesis. So here it is. Since my p-value is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. And if I'm going to reject my null hypothesis, what would I do with my final decision? So I'm going to state my conclusion about the alternative. And that says, there is strong evidence that the tested treatments are not equally effective in preventing the recurrence of depression. Remember, if you go back to our null and alternative hypotheses, let's go all the way back, the null basically says all three treatments were the same, and the alternative says that, the, that at least one of the treatments differs, okay? The rate of recurrence differs for some of the treatments. Since I'm rejecting my null hypothesis here, my conclusion is that there is strong evidence that the tested tre treatments are not equally effective in preventing the recurrence of depression. I know this video was kind of long, but hopefully it was helpful to you, and have fun in your stats class.